Hey guys, I hope you're all doing okay. Today I thought of making this video on a special request of a listener. She's a woman and a very capable young woman. And like many of us women out there who are capable, intelligent, and smart, she wanted to know about what is imposter syndrome. And I have been wanting to make this video for a very long time because I have caught myself struggling with this imposter syndrome for a long period of my adult life. And I have a feeling that many of you women who are, or men as well, who are watching this video are also struggling with imposter syndrome or have at some point or the other struggled with this condition. So that's why I thought of making this video for you and sharing some of my own personal experiences with imposter syndrome, what helped me, and why I thought I developed imposter syndrome later on in my life, especially as soon as I joined a professional college. My name is Dr. Najman Riaz. I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I have my own small virtual And we're going to talk about this very interesting but a very common condition called the imposter syndrome. So if you're like many of us, if you have caught yourself questioning your competence, a deep feeling that what if, what if people find out who I truly am or that I'm not good enough? for most of my adult life, believe it or not. Growing up, I was a very confident child, despite being raised in a middle-class family. Most likely, I give all the credit to my father. I was a daddy's girl, and my father was an extremely loving, caring, and an emotionally in tune parent. He was very respectful of my feelings and always encouraged me to do my best. Even though I came from a culture where the society was kind of more so like a male dominated and women had to follow certain rules and had to act in a certain way. And during the time when women had to work extra hard to make a mark in their fields. Now remember, I'm talking about 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, it's kind of ironic that when I moved to America and I moved uh, around about in 1997, so I expected things to be very different here. But as I started to know the culture from inside, I was pretty surprised and quite shocked to see that things are not much different here, especially after the Me Too movement started taking effect. 
I notice that more and more women here suffer from imposter syndrome and how hard we women have to work to get anywhere in our career. Until high school, I was very much under the influence of my feministic father and I had developed a pretty good sense of self. At least that's what I thought during that time. So I truly felt deserving of whatever I had achieved uh, in my uh, school up until high school. And I felt the sense of pride uh, in my accomplishments. Now remember, I also had my education in an all-girls convent school, uh, so where there was a nice balance of morals and very strong academics. Girls were very driven, and there was also a healthy sense of competition. So interestingly enough, as I left this overprotected environment of my high school, and I came to the real world, I started my med school, uh, and that med school was a co-ed college. So I got to see the real world, how the real world looks like. I somehow noticed my self-esteem was kind of taking a little bit of a nosedive. In med school, there I noticed that there was more focus on things that were superficial, how people associated with groups. And unfortunately, those groups were based on financial backgrounds. So rich would hang together, and so would those who shared common academic excellence. I had quite a hard time fitting in. It took me quite a while to find my tribe, and thank God I did. I felt comfortable with a group of students who value connection, simplicity, sense of humor, authenticity, and true friendship based on what we believed, rather than the brand of your car, the size of your home, or your father's paycheck. So things started changing again as I got engaged to a brilliant physician whom I had an arranged marriage with, because that time in India, you know, we, we had arranged marriages. It was very common. He had created quite a name for himself, and he was a very accomplished student. Now, I was a little above average, but definitely not someone who would be on a dean's list or someone who the teachers would be bragging about. Thank God for that. So after I got engaged to him, I felt this weird sense of insecurity inside me. I felt that my teachers will compare me with him, and I just could not match to his level of academic excellence. And they did. Yeah, many of my professors in med school would like outrightly bully me. They would make comments like, wow, do you realize that how smart your fiance is and how average you are? I can't believe it either that they said something like that. Of course, out of ignorance, they started comparing me with my fiance. Now he's a bit of a nerd and extremely competitive, quite a bit of a workaholic too. And I, on the other hand, was this fun-loving, easygoing, non-competitive young woman, a bit of a daydreamer. And I enjoyed being a physician because I enjoyed being with people. I love to connect with people, love to take care of them, take away their pain, comfort them. But Well, that's a story for some next day. So I hope that you listeners can slowly work on your imposter syndrome. And I just hope that you don't have to wait like me for an adversity like a pandemic in order for you to come out of it. So as I went into the field of psychiatry, I started questioning my own beliefs and I realized that why this imposter syndrome had hit me in med school as opposed to early in life. Imposter syndrome typically arises in competitive environments or environments where one's abilities may be measured in some capacity. And med schools, professional colleges, and other competitive workplaces are breeding grounds for imposter syndrome. Now, many people who have imposter syndrome may also have been raised in families that stress achievement and success. If your parents went back and forth between overpraising you and then criticizing you, you may be more likely to have feelings of being a fraud later on in life. Feelings of low self-esteem, lack of confidence, negative thinking, self-doubt and are characteristic behaviors of those who suffer from imposter syndrome. How common is imposter syndrome? 
very common. 25 to 30 percent of overachievers develop imposter syndrome, and at least 70 percent of adults have struggled with an imposter syndrome at some or the other time in their life. Now, remember, imposter syndrome is not it's not bad to have it. Many people who struggle from imposter syndrome are smart, they're intelligent, they're in tune, they're very self-aware, which is as compared to a condition which is just the opposite of the imposter syndrome where a person develops overconfidence, he overestimates his accomplishments. And in fact, some of them may even come across as harsh and braggy and somewhat of a narcissist. And this condition that's the opposite of imposter syndrome is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Now that may be a topic for a different video, but in this video, we're gonna just try to focus on this imposter syndrome. Historically speaking, recognition of imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome dates back to about 1970s. There were two psychologists to observe this in, as I said, high achieving professional women. Around 1978, Dr. Clance noticed that high achieving women uh, get these feelings of self Valerie Young uh, subdivided them into various categories or various subtypes. Uh, and honestly, I have caught myself having some characteristics of every different kind, like a little bit of all these different kinds. The first and foremost is the perfectionistic kind. And I know that many of you might relate to that. They have to do things perfectly. They are very hard on themselves and if things don't come out perfect, they're going to keep on repeating those projects. They're never satisfied with the kind of work that they did. So these perfectionistic individuals set up very impossible and unreasonable standards for themselves. Then there is number second, are the super women or what's called the workaholic imposter syndrome. I have caught myself being in that category in various areas of my life. You know, I had three kids and I remember as a mother to those three children, I may have fit myself in that superwoman kind of a character where I would go to extremes into taking care of my children's needs, making sure that, you know, they're doing extracurricular activities. Now looking back, I wish I had hired some babysitters and made my job easy. But that that time, you know, I really didn't want to hire babysitters and I just wanted be, to be there for my children. I was also working a part-time job. So there was a lot of responsibility that I had taken. My three children have helped me grow, but however, looking back, I don't think I needed to be too hard on myself. And I think it would have been a very healthy thing, not just for them, but for myself also, had I hired some babysitters. Yeah, so people who fall under under that category can struggle with work addiction and they feel inadequate uh, relative to their colleagues. They continue to push themselves as hard as possible regardless of the consequences that it can have on their mental and emotional well-being. Now there's a third kind of imposter syndrome which is called the natural genius. So those kind of people are again they struggle with perfectionism but they're also out to achieve uh, very lofty goals. You know they set up their bar very high on themselves and if they don't uh, reach to those goals they consider themselves inadequate incompetent and less than because remember there's nothing wrong with setting up high goals for yourself the difference between someone who sets up high goals in a healthy way and as opposed to someone who struggles with imposter syndrome is a person with imposter syndrome will set up unreasonable high expectations for themselves and if they don't reach to those expectations or even if they fall short of those goals that they had set for themselves they feel like a failure they feel inadequate they feel uh, anxious and they are very hard on themselves but those people who set up healthy high expectations for themselves uh, they may if they reach those expectations they feel pride in themselves and if they fall short on those they're not hard on themselves they go like all right you know what i tried i set up a goal maybe i need to work a little bit more harder uh, 
So that's the difference. Now the fourth category that Dr. Uh, Young has described are the soloists. So the soloists are those people who have extreme difficulties in asking help from other people. In fact, to ask help, they feel like a sense of failure. They go like, if I ask help from other person, this person will think that I am not good enough. I can't do it on my own. So they're going to struggle. They're going to begin beat themselves. They're going to take days to finish that task. They could have done a better job had they asked for help. Being on that imposter syndrome and having that insecurity, as I said in med school, I did catch myself uh, not asking for help. And I do want to share something here, that our culture is also plays an important role in this. Like for example, in the West or in modern societies, asking for for help is considered to be a sign of maturity. However, there are still some cultures like in developing countries where there is more of an authoritarian sort of a setup. Like people may be afraid to ask for help, not just because they suffer from imposter syndrome, but also there could be some anxiety in asking for help because honestly, I come from the same culture and I have seen that in professional settings, uh, in schools and colleges, asking for help is really not encouraged. In fact, you are supposed to, or you are told that you got to go figure it out. You have to find it on your own. So if you're coming from that culture and that's what you catch yourselves doing, I, I think it is important to separate uh, that is it really you? Is it really your feelings of insecurity, your own inner imposter syndrome, or is it something which is cultural? Maybe your culture is discouraging to ask for help. It's important to make that distinction there. Now also in the cultural piece, a person will be anxious to ask for help. But if you're struggling with an imposter syndrome and do not want to ask for help, there is it's not that you're anxious or you're scared to ask for help, but